delighted to say I'm with Tracy Thorne. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. It's really good to see you because I've just seen you at the playback for the album. Yes. At the RVT. That was good fun, wasn't it? It was really good fun. (laughs) And you were DJing afterwards as well. I was. Well, I was pointing at the records I wanted played. I'm a bit rubbish one there. That's the way to do it, though, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I was the selector. (laughs) Yeah. You started with Joyce Sims. Yes. Coming to my life. Brilliant song. Great way to start a DJ set, too. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you what you made of that song when you first heard it and what it means to you now oh god i can't remember i mean i actually can't remember it's just you know songs that become part of your you know the sort of repertoire in your mind of things you remember dancing to yeah um you know don't forget i grew up through that era when i got into the first of all i got into you know punk bands and post-punk bands and, and went to loads of gigs and lots of like parties at people's houses and i do remember those moments when you'd sort of get to the point of the evening where you'd think but we want to dance now it's all very well having our like post-punk records but now we need to dance and that's when you know we realized that actually we need dance records as well <laughs> so you know that moment when people always used to say oh like you know punk was very anti-disco and everything there was these kind of diametric diametrically opposed um styles of music but actually as i remember it everyone was a lot more open-minded because you needed things to dance to and that's the best way of approaching music i think generally is well, just to be yeah, eclectic definitely. isn't it it makes more sense to me yeah now especially once you start making music yourself you think even more clearly you think well honestly i don't i don't want to be put into a little box so why would i do that to other people's music absolutely now your playback was to celebrate your new album which is fantastic it's called record thank you um it's a really bright vibrant album i'm guessing that was the point to make it not deliberately because obviously it's a very genuine thing that you're creating that style but no i really wanted to make a kind of upbeat kind of album i mean part of what motivated motivated me to start making was that I was feeling a bit depressed about the world in general yeah. and, you know, events, you know, around the world, political stuff, getting drawn into, you know, following the rolling news on Twitter and everything all the time. And I started to think, well, you know, I can either do my nut about this or there's that feeling that if you're creative, it's just still an, an act of positivity out there in the world. You know, you're bringing something into the world. Um, so I thought, well, I want to express some of this, but I want it to be in a format that itself is uplifting. You know, it's fun to listen to, that it'll be fun to make. Yeah, um, thank you know, God you've done that. Making we need a dance that. record is fun to make. So. Yeah, it sounds like you had fun recording yeah. it. So many great tracks that I love on there. I mean, my favourite track is the closing track, and it's always good to end on the dance floor. I think Definitely. it is actually a dance floor yeah. track. Um, and also, I, I just realised that it, it's quite a snappy album because it's 36 minutes in length. Mm. A lot of albums nowadays are really long, kind of a bit baggy almost, some. Yeah. All the album titles as well, they're all one word. Yeah, there's, so there's, really... a, there's a deliberate minimalism to it all. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like things that don't outstay their welcome. And I do find a lot of records nowadays are too long. Yeah. You know, since we got the capacity for albums to be really any length you like, um, there's there's not really much of a limit. A lot of people have thought, well, you know, that must make it better than if you've got 18 songs, that must be better than 12. Yeah. But, you know, I do still partly think I'd rather have... 10 stone cold classics than a lot of filler so yeah there's a deliberate minimalism in terms of the length one word titles the titles often kind of sum up the theme of the song so you can almost like chart your way through the record just by looking at the titles it tells a little story almost in one word it does what it says on the tin it does what it says on the tin and you're back with you and Pearson who's produced it and I was going to say at at the playback it sounded fantastic on the loud system on the I thought so I actually sent you in a text saying I'm staying in the Vauxhall Tavern listening to it over the speakers and it sounds brilliant it sounds so alive doesn't it well that's his production you know he's I felt like I hadn't in the past completely made use of the fact that Ewan is a remixer and a DJ and he knows exactly how to make things sound brilliant in a club you know on big speakers in that kind of room yeah. so this time I said to him right come on we're going to really make use of all that we've done a mixture of things we've done a little bit of dance stuff together but also quite a lot more sort of acoustic style recordings which he's also very good at and um, you mentioned that dance floor could be the next single perhaps yes I think so I think so. There was always a thought that that one might work, so I'm hoping that will... And I mentioned that it was a snappy album. I mean, in mm. some ways, it's it's not, because, Sister, you just mentioned that track. It's nine minutes long. Yeah, see, that's Karim the exception Valley. to prove the rule. It's so brilliant, because it's so brooding, and it mm. just builds and builds all the way through the track. I mean, it's really current, because it's really mm. for 
female power, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's what it stands for. And it's kind of against that whole male aggression thing. Yeah. Which is really, really topical. And well, it's, it's interesting because, I, you know, I wrote it, obviously, a year ago, but I wrote it after I'd just come home from being on the Women's March in London, which was last January. So if you think about it, you know, even back then, when that march and marches around the world were organised in the wake of, you know, Trump's election and the things that had been said during the campaign, you know, women were already angry and feeling like under threat again. So I came home from that march feeling actually quite inspired, having seen that many people together and feeling again that support you get when you, you're with a lot of other people and you think, OK, I'm not alone. I'm not mad. You yeah. know, lo- all these people agree. So that's what inspired the song. And I did feel like I hope it's understood when it comes out. I hope people get the message, you know, and here it is a year later. You know, we're right slap bang in the middle of, you know, this conversation has got even bigger and has you know broken out in all sorts of other areas and so i'm really pleased to feel like i'm contributing yeah. you know something to the conversation in a lot of ways it's a really good time for women i think at the moment yeah well it to is, go through it, all that yeah absolutely the fact that you know i feel like women are saying things they've been saying for a long time but if people are listening and if something's changing because of it then yeah that feels like a good power thing. to the people exactly power to the women <laughs> Um, I was going to mention the Pet Shop Boys collaboration answering the question <laughs> yes. at um, Amy LeMay's brilliant Q&A that you did at yeah. the playback at the RVT. Um, you mentioned that you haven't collaborated with them and I, I think it needs to happen. Um, I've always joked about that, that, you know, just and there's the, I, I, on stage, I think I did the call me Pet Shop Boys thing. Someone yeah. took a photo of it that I've actually got now. So <laughs> I might just post that, just a little caption, you know, call me Neil. <laughs> Ever since I first heard them, I, the, that sound they made i just thought it was incredibly beautiful then when they've done you know had dusty springfield on their records you know made a record with liza minnelli and i've heard what they've done with you know other amazing women singers you think god it is just a marriage made in heaven you yeah. know that sort of combination so yeah, melancholy in my dreams. and uplifting melancholy and uplifting my favorite combination my favorite yeah. combination um and susie sue i can see you working with her so oh, i've wow. worn my t-shirt as Marvelous. celebration nice. of our yeah. beloved um because i know that you love her as well yes. and you grew up listening to her mm. she was an amazing performer at that time as well i mean i still if ever i catch you know little snippets on tv of her doing a performance and it reminds me just how fantastic she was on stage um i mean she always looked brilliant obviously um, but she had a really great way of of being on stage you know invented her own style of dancing um, yeah. and I think that's you, you know you can forget that about performers sometimes you just listen to the records and they're strong but actually when someone has a presence about them that you can't quite see where it's come from you know it's not obviously borrowed from anyone they've just come up with something really distinctive so. and you were very inspired by her at the start of your career yeah vocally yes. too I was. I did. I did have a couple of experiences in the first band I was in of um, trying to sing like her, which I could only ever manage for about five minutes. Yeah, my cover of Rebel Rebel, which I, <laughs> I did in my best Susie voice. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Not I mean, captured on tape anywhere. I don't think. Sadly. Who wouldn't want to sound like her though? Yeah, exactly. It was. It was an exciting way of singing. And you have got another book coming. I'm really excited about this because your previous two books were fantastic. Such a great read. Um, very different because obviously the first book was autobiographical, and the mm. second one was about singing and performance Mm. is the next one going to be even different again well it is very autobiographical but it just goes back to the period of my life before what i covered in beds at disco queen so it's the whole period before i um joined a band so it's being a teenager in suburbia in the 1970s and some of it's very funny there's a lot of stuff from my diaries um which are funny and very honest and then just i talk a lot about the kinds of things that inspired me and you know, helped me to escape from the confines of 1970s suburbia. Because there is a lot of comedy in your writing, in your record yeah. writing too, which is yeah. always picked up on by, by people, by fans and journalists. And you work for the New Statesman, you write a column for them now too. Mm. Is there anything particularly in the moment that you're really happy to write about or or angry to write about? Anything that sticks out? Well, you know, what's great about the New Statesman is they don't ever tell me what to write about, so I can really mix it up. And I do try to keep it varied. I try and write about, you know, I write about music, I write about books, and then occasionally I write about just something that's happening out there in the world. You know, I wrote a column about feminism a couple of weeks ago, talking about that whole sort of, you know, slight clash between the different generations and what part of the waves of feminism I'm a part of and talking about younger women and how, you know, I try to, you know, remain in solidarity with, with you know, the younger women coming up behind us and listen to what they've got to say and got to offer. 
It's good to have that creative freedom, isn't it? It's amazing. I think I'm very lucky. When I started, I thought, you know, oh, they'll they'll probably start giving me like subjects I've got to write about. Maybe that'll be a bit scary. Yeah. Um, but actually, that you know, it's I think because I'm in the back of the magazine where it's we've had all the politics. <laughs> you sort of wade through all the politics. You get to the back pages, and then it's a bit more just you know you can open up and talk about anything. Are you excited about the new album? About the reaction to the album? I'm really excited. I have to say, I'm really proud of the record. Um, it's turned out. You know, how I wanted it. I think it sounds really strong. Um, it's one of those records that, you know, I sort of want to get hold of people and go, can yeah. I play you my new record? Yeah. Um, and that's that's a nice feeling. It's That's always exciting. Play it on a loud system. Like, yeah, I know. I do want everyone to just hear it, of, you know, in a club. Basically. They need to hear it loud. Yeah. I think that's the point again, isn't it? Is that it's a party album. Yeah, it is. And, and, and you know, it, it's... Um, just everything kind of comes alive, I think, in that sort of environment. Um, and sometimes I've made records that are maybe are perfect just in your room on your own, you know, in complete sort of yeah. quiet and silence and peace and quiet. Um, but, you know, this one, it's got that kind of, you know, vibrant energy to it that it really comes alive, I think, when you hear it in that space. And I mentioned the humour in your writing on dance floor, particularly uh, you write Where I Like To Be is on the dance floor with some drinks inside of me. Such a brilliant yeah. line. <laughs> <laughs> what is your tipple? Oh, a martini is always nice. Oh, yeah. Mm. Can't always get a good martini, though. That's very martini true. Martini and dance floor, you know, that's like the dream club, really, isn't it? I wish you all the best with the album. I think it's great. Thank you. It's so good to see you today. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks very much. 